It's very nice to be here. I'm going to try to... Can you hear me now? Is that better? Can you turn this up at all? No, just... I don't know, not from here. Yeah, okay, that's all right. Anyway, you gave most of the lecture already, Al, so I don't have too much more to say. Um, but um, I do want to... I do want to say that um, I know for many of you, September 11 is a date that will uh, live in your memory, <clears throat> and uh, it certainly has been living in my memory for almost 30 years. Uh, it was on September 11, uh, 1973, that U.S.-backed military in Chile overthrew the Chilean democracy, which was a democratic coalition government uh, headed by Salvador Allende, Dr. Salvador Allende, uh, and about 30,000 people were killed in that, uh, in that uh, coup over, over a period of about uh, several years. Uh, another 100,000 were driven into exile or, or arrested, tortured, and thousands more disappeared, um, never accounted for, never showed up. Henry Kissinger, who was Secretary of State, and Richard Nixon, Nixon who was President, um, were the people who um, really were very much behind that coup. That was an act of momentous terror. It was a terrorism. Death squads were used, people were dragged out of their houses, people were put up against the wall in the stadiums and summarily executed. That's terrorism at work. And so it has been in the last half century that U.S. leaders, I don't say the United States, and I don't say we. We go and we do this and we go do that. I say, we? Wait a minute, we? No, we pay the taxes, we get screwed over, we get drafted, to go, or we have to go in the army. And do that. They, it's they who do this. U.S. leaders uh, have, been, have intervened directly with force and violence. The terror bombing of El Chirio, uh, neighborhoods in Panama City. How many people have heard about it? Not that much, because the media didn't really give it the kind of play that you would get. 3,000 people killed uh, there in Panama City when George Bush the first, George the first invaded Panama. Um, the the uh, two million people who have died in Angola uh, with the CIA supported UNITA, war of attrition against Angola. The almost a million who have died in Mozambique, uh, uh, again, with uh, these terror squads called RINAMO as an act, it was is the the headline, the, the, uh, the abbreviated title, it's, it's not an acronym really, uh, and again, supported by U.S. forces. The million people who were killed in the military coup in Indonesia, which overthrew uh, uh, Sukarno, uh, <clears throat> a military that was trained, equipped, advised, and whose salaries were even paid by the CIA and the U.S. State Department and such, uh, so there have been these acts of mass murder. Now, the American people know very little of that. Very little of that gets even reported. The Indonesian massacre, in fact, didn't, wasn't even reported until several months later, and it got a box like this in, the, in, the, in Time magazine, and, and one story in the New York Times with an editorial applauding the military and saying, that's very good, that's, that's a stabilizing thing. And in Nicaragua, the, the uh, Contra... Back, U.S. backed troops who went in there and, and hit what they call soft targets, which were farming cooperatives, schools, community houses, um, granaries, um, energy stations, um, housing projects, just hit them and killing people and terrorizing, spreading terror and disillusion, d disabling and dis destabilizing these countries. Rios Mont. Now this is, by the way, what I'm telling you is all a matter of public record. Rios Mont in Guatemala, who went with the Guatemalan army, that maddened, insane murder machine called the Guatemalan army, and President Clinton last year, you remember, two years ago, even went and apologized to Guatemala and said, we're sorry for our role. When Rios Montt went in there and wiped out 600 Mayan villages, 600 of them, 200,000 people, men, women, and children killed every single one of them in sight. And, and Clinton actually apologized and said, I feel your pain, I'm sorry. He didn't explain why was the U.S. supporting this thug and this terrorizer and this murderer. Why are we hated throughout the Middle East after we bombed Somalia and killed 10,000 people with a military intervention? Compliments of George I and Clinton who, who continued it. 
Why are we hated throughout Latin America? It's not just the Middle East. You can go through Latin America, you can go through other parts of the world, Pacific world, the Pacific Basin, and you'll find people who will see the United States as intervening everywhere. Intervening either directly with their own troops, as in Grenada, Panama, Somalia, Iraq, Yugoslavia. I was in Yugoslavia in the summer of 1999, after Clinton's 76 days of bombing around the clock. You want to talk about terror? You could see it. This is not, by the way, this is not to justify or excuse what happened in New York, which was a horrible thing. But that's the point. The horror has come home. And we can see suddenly what other people have been going through. Not with a plane going into a building, but with carpet bombing, with hitting, knocking out bridges in the Danube River. Depleted uranium in the Danube River, which is a source of drinking water for millions of people. The cancer cases. The next year I went to Iraq and I saw children with cancer. They said the, the cancer, the leukemia rate among children has just skyrocketed, especially in southern Iraq around Basra and there. And, and to see these kids in these hospitals is one of the most heartbreaking things. From the terror bombing of U.S. and NATO forces in Iraq, spreading out that depleted uranium and everything else. They said we never had a high cancer rate in this country um, until that happened. All of that is terror. And so, people, but you see, our media doesn't tell us that. Our media tells us that we are an innocent nation. We are uh, an American nation who has been holding out a helping hand to people all over the world. And now these forces of evil hate us. They hate us because we love freedom. Well, I think the, I think the people are rather innocent. I think they're innocent of what their leaders do in their name. And I think maybe it's time that we wake up because the, the first condition of a democratic citizenry is to have a critical view of what's going on. I remember during the Gulf War, a student saying to me, well, this is the difference between you and me. Yeah, it's not very pretty what's happening there. They are destroying a lot of things. But I have my faith in President Bush. I place my faith in President Bush. That was the first Bush. Bush the first. George the first he was talking about. And I said... He said, I trust President Bush. I said, what do you mean you have your faith? You have faith in President Bush? Faith? What are we doing? Religion here or politics? You have faith the way my Italian grandma had faith in St. Anthony? She said, oh, my God. You go, oh, Georgie e. Bush, you God bless. You light a candle to him? Or what are you talking about? Faith. What do you mean you trust? Trust. Trust, which is something where you put your interest in someone else's hands, something you do only with very close friends and loved ones. And even them, check them out once in a while, right? That's what trust is about. But democracy, democracy is about distrust. Democracy is about accountability. Democracy is about exposure. It's about political competition. It's about debate. It's about showing us what are the reasons you're doing this. What are the reasons you want another 20 billion for this, another 20 billion for that? What are the reasons you want to tax us even more and tax us even more? For what? What are the reasons you want to send American boys and girls now over uh, to this country or that country or the other country? What's the reason that we have 350 military bases all over the world? Why do we have our fleet making port in about 40 different countries? Why are we, uh, why do we, why are we militarizing outer space now with new forms of weaponry we hope we should be able to attack and um, immobilize whole populations? Um, with new electromagnetic weapons and all this sort of thing. Why are they doing it? Why are we training and supplying and financing the troops and the paramilitaries and the police of scores and scores of other nations? Is it because to guard them from attacking each other? No, El Salvador wasn't going to invade Guatemala. Guatemala wasn't going to invade Nicaragua. Nicaragua wasn't going to invade Honduras. No, it was to arm them to the teeth to keep their own people under the heel of those client state rulers. Well, why would we do that? Why are those U.S. leaders doing that? I would argue that it's not, as they say, to protect democracy in these countries. In some cases, they overthrew democracies. I already gave you an example. In Chile, in 1973. In Guatemala, in 1954. In Haiti, under Father Aristide. Death squads killing Haitians. A popular movement. 
the people mobilizing themselves for something better. That's not what U.S. policy is about because George Bush and his friends and Bill Clinton and his friends do not represent the interests of the American people. They represent the interests of the transnational corporations. Their goal is to make the world safe for the Fortune 500, to prevent competing forms of political economic governance, that, that prevent countries or movements or organizations develop that say, we want to use the land and the labor and the capital and the natural resources of our country for our collective development, for ourselves. And we don't want to leave this open and leave it as just so much raw material for you guys to come in, take as you want your agribusiness firms, your, um, your banks, your investors, your whatever else. Well, that, that really is what it is about, I would say. Because you can look and you can see there are dictators, and the U.S. opposes some of them, but also loves others. When Fidel Castro took over in Cuba and formed what he thought was a popular dictatorship, he was asked, do you have freedom of the press? He said, no, we don't really. You're not free in Cuba to preach capitalism, racism, sexism, or imperialism, or those things. We do have a controlled press. Why don't you have our capitalist point of view in, in here in Cuba? He said, well, we get all your stations from Miami anyway, but we'll be happy to put your viewpoint on our official television when you would make time and put our viewpoint on your television. Oh, oh well, we can't do that because we have a free and independent press. Right. Okay, so we are told that we must oppose Cuba because Fidel Castro is a dictator. But wait a minute. Before Fidel Castro took power in 1959, there had been 20 years of rule by a dictator. His name was Batista. Batista was a butcher. He was hated by the Cuban people. And the U.S. loved him, kissed him, hugged him, gave, made nice nice with him, sent him aid, trained his Guarda Civil, uh, uh, and all this sort of thing. Why? What's the difference? What was the difference between Batista and Castro? The difference was that Batista was a cooperative dictator. What does that mean? It means that he opened up his country to U.S. interests. He says, come on in, boys. The tobacco industry here, the best in the world, right? Cuban tobacco, Cuban cigars, it's yours. The cotton industry, the sugar industry, the magnesium, the mining, the shell food, the tourist industry, big one, all yours. You guys come on in. You own it all, Yankees. You can have it. You can profit. And I keep my people down so that they work hard for less. And the less you have to pay them, the more there is for you. And all you got to do, though, is take care of me, my family, my brother Juan, my brother Jose, my cousin this and that. You give me my boodle. You train my police and paramilitary, and we'll take care of everything for you. And so it was a client-state relationship. So what you had was U.S. tax money going in there to make the world safe, to make Cuba safe for big U.S. investments, even exporting some of our jobs there, by the way. I was looking at, Guada I was looking at El Salvador. Do you know who's in El Salvador? ITT, General Motors. Firestone, uh, Microsoft, and I'm saying, what the hell's in El Salvador? I mean, there's just what, some bananas, some sugar. I mean, what are all these big companies doing in El Salvador? Well, they've gone in there, you know, they've gone in there for that other resource. That other resource which adds value to any production and gives you your profit. That other resource which is called labor. They go down for the labor. And, and you have Salvadorians making energy rods, rubber tires, uh, uh, automobile parts, name it, everything. Um, so there go our jobs. Our jobs are being exported. Now, I don't begrudge other people getting jobs in the, in the industrial world, but first of all, they're not getting, getting decent pay, but not when it, it's at the expense of people who have been fighting to get a higher standard of political, demo of economic democracy. I think they give you a glass or something. It looks kind of undignified, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Hey, so how am I doing so far? Okay, eh? <laughs> All right. So, um, another goal is not only to prevent competing forms of capital, such as socialist or collectivist or communitarian or whatever else, and that's where the pattern has been generally. You attack those those authoritarian countries that are trying any kind of distributive politics. Iraq is a very fascinating example, but I'm going to get to that in a minute. Uh, but you also attack, you also support certain democracies if they are free market democracies, and you attack democracies also that might be trying to redistribute things. Salvador Allende's crime in, in Chile was he did not interfere with anybody's democratic rights. Not any newspaper, not any radio station, not any, any demonstration, whatever else. What he did do is he started to interfere with certain e e economic rights, ITT and the big copper industry, and he started saying, this should be publicly owned, we got to take some of this money, spend less of it on the military, more on people, more on building up clinics, schools, uh, uh, neighborhood industries, and the like. And that's when they hit him. He wasn't like Batista. He didn't say, come on in, boys, it's all yours. He did say, we need a minimum wage. If you come in, you've got to pay our workers a decent wage, etc., etc. And corporations really generally don't like that, you see. If you're a head of a corporation, you always have this problem that your workers and others want to spend money on really stupid, stupid things. Stupid things like wages, pensions, health care plans, paid holidays, sick leave, environmental protections, occupational safety. When will it end? Stupid things. Every dollar I got to spend on stupid things like that is one less dollar I can put in my pocket or give to my stockholders. And so Allende was troublesome and he had to be done in. Don't believe me. Listen to Henry Kissinger, who was Secretary of State. He said, if you've got to choose between democracy and the economy, you go for the economy. He said that. I thought it was nice. I mean, every so often they get a little close to the truth. You know, oh, look at that. Henry almost said something that was true. The other thing... The other thing that you, uh, the other thing U.S. policy is dedicated to now is not only to stop competing forms of capital, as in Libya with uh, Gaddafi, who is turning Libya. There's another case. Libya was run by dictators before. U.S. loved them. Gaddafi came in with his, with his colonels, took over the country. He took over a social structure that was like Saudi Arabia, that is where a fraction of 1% obscenely rich, owned everything in Libya, all, got all the, all the oil revenues, kicked them out, nationalized the oil industry, took the earnings from the oil industry and started doing things like reforestation, uh, Libyan people were allowed to go to school, free education for the first time in their history, uh, free medical care, so forth and so on, doing those kinds of things. That's not what the world should be about. The world is not to be organized to benefit that 95, 98%. It's organized to benefit that 2 or 3% at the top. Okay, in addition, U.S. policy we're now seeing is also dedicated to preventing competing formations of capital, not competing capital forms. You get the difference? Would I say a socialist or collectivist society would be a, a competing capital form. But it's also now dedicated to, to stopping competing formations of capitalism. That makes it clear. Competing formations of capitalism. Not only competing forms, but within the global capitalist sphere itself. One of the problems with the third world is not that people are stupid or lazy or poor or can't do anything. In fact, the opposite is that people were developing and they were developing their industries. You know, you used to get certain countries in Africa, you used to get raw leather hides from them. And then before you know it, you got conditioned, finished leather. And then before you know it, you started getting leather goods. 
purses, shoes, and all this sort of thing. Hey, we don't want that. We don't want those things competing with us. Now, for a while, for a while, for a while, they were. For a while, they were allowing that. Much of the third world was getting some aid. There was the feeling that, well, we need, we need to develop some level of prosperity, otherwise these people will go communist, and we can't have that. So, <clears throat> what do we do? We give them some aid and all that sort of thing, and we look out for U.S. interests too. But then suddenly something happened. The communist countries fell, were overthrown. The Soviet Union was overthrown and that sort of thing. And there was a big celebration. We said, we won. We've won. There is no alternative system. It's going to be global capitalism from now on. Shortly after that, a rather querulous note began to be injected in conservative magazines and publications. And it went like this. It says, we now have Eastern Europe going into a free market f system. And that meant, you know, the end of pensions, the end of minimum wages, the end of wage guarantee, or job guarantees, uh, the end of all those things. Uh, a, a tremendous, sudden tremendous climb in crime, homelessness, poverty, prostitution, beggary, and the like, all through Russia, Ukraine, Hungary, Slovakia, Bulgaria, and, 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 and now Yugoslavia. Um, why, why don't we do rollback here too? That is, the whole idea is to really oppose competing formations of capitalism. If I can undo your system, privatize it and deindustrialize it and really impoverish it, that elevates the value of my capital. I don't have to worry about your prosperity anymore. There's no Soviet Union for you to get competing aid from. Um, I don't have to worry about it. The world is ours. So what we've had now is a, a rollback. Wipe out the economy, flood its markets with underpriced Western subsidized goods, privatize its industries, eliminate competing capitalist forms, eliminate nonprofit public ownership. One thing that happened in Yugoslavia the minute Milosevic was kicked out was the Kostanica government came in and they put up for privatization 7,000 businesses worker controlled businesses, worker owned, community controlled businesses, all of them put up for privatization. Most of privatization, by the way, ends up to be just de industrialized. They buy it for garage sale and then they just put it out of business or put it in mothballs. Um, a very good case is Saddam Hussein. It's Iraq. Saddam Hussein was CIA. He came in, he was working with the CIA to destroy the Iraqi revolution, which he did. He destroyed the Kurdish Independent Party. He destroyed the, uh, the um, Ba'ath, ba he destroyed the left wing of his own Ba'athist Party. He destroyed the Communist Party. He destroyed all that. He was the CIA's boy. Then he did something that was got, got rather annoying. Because now the ante is up. Now it's no longer, okay, sure, help you people do this, that, but make sure you have private capital because we've got to watch out for the, 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 the Russians. We don't want you to go socialist. Now he's not going to go socialist, but he's, he's a competing capitalist form. He's doing something else. He's doing development. He started training engineers and a whole uh, uh, technical, technological and professional class in Iraq. Uh, Iraq had the highest standard of living in the Middle East. He was looking for a better deal on the oil prices. He was getting uppity about the oil prices and standing up to the U.S. and the West and that sort of thing. And he had to be dealt with. How is he dealt with? First of all, the same way that Noriega was dealt with, the same way Gaddafi was dealt with, the same way Milosevic is dealt with. Um, you demonize him. You talk about what a a demon he is, and that gives you license then to bomb and attack his people. So this is what I think we have before us. And, and I think now we've explained a mystery. Why, after half a century of Western investment and aid, the third world is not better off, but poorer? It's poorer than it's ever been before. The number of people living in poverty throughout the world is growing at a faster rate than the world's population. And the world's population is, is growing at quite a pace, isn't it? Poverty is spreading as wealth grows and accumulates. 
The goal of Western investment is not to develop competing formations of capitalism or capital, but to advance the profits of capital accumulation of Western investors. The relationship between wealth and poverty is not just the juxtaposition. We often say, look at all this wealth here and, and look at all this poverty here. It isn't this terrible? Like it's just an unfortunate happenstance. In fact, that's not just a juxtaposition, but a dynamic interrelation. Wealth creates poverty. That's how you get poverty, by accumulating wealth. The way you get the rich slave owner living in such luxury on those gorgeous, glorious plantations is by having slaves and working them day and night. James Madison said that for every slave he had on his plant, James Madison, by the way, was a president of the United States. Um, he was the fourth president of the United States. He said for every slave on his plantation, he reckoned he made $275 a year in profits, and it cost him only $24 to sustain that slave. So that's, that's quite a profit, that's very good. And this was back in the days when, you know, $275 could buy you Rhode Island or something. So. Okay, that's a, you can't have feudal lords living in great castles unless you have serfs whose labor is being exploited and the expropriation, the surplus of their labor goes to the lords. And you can't have big, rich, <coughs> corporate transnational capitalists unless you have workers. So the world is, you see, divided into column A and column B. In column A are those people who live mostly off earnings from investments, dividends on stocks, interest on bonds, <coughs> rents on properties, royalties on, uh, on natural resources like oil well ownings, this sort of thing. And in column B are people who live mostly on wages, salaries, fees, commissions. Work, in other words. Uh, and what people in column A and column B have in common is that they both live off the labor of the people in column B. <coughs> David Rockefeller, you can say, well, David Rockefeller, he's retired now, but he used to work. He was the head of Rockefeller Brothers. Yeah, he worked, he could work very hard, but that can't explain the immense wealth he was making. David Rockefeller will sit here for an hour with you, and he leaves this room, he's richer than when he walked in. Maybe not this week, but generally he is. You, you walk out here poorer, because that, that little bit of money you got in the bank has already gotten chewed up a little bit by inflation by now. Um, people in column A make up less than 1% of the world's population. The rest of the people are in column B. Of course, there are many differences. There are people who can make more, who are prosperous, uh, and so forth. But for the most part, everybody still has to keep working. And that policy, the policy and the class that George Bush represents is, is the people in column A. And none of that benefit trickles down to us. When Nike moves, closes down U.S. jobs in Ohio, where they're paying people $18, $20 an hour of benefits and everything else, and he moves to Indonesia, where they're paying people 18 cents an hour, uh, Nike does that, and they, they, it's not for, to for give you a better deal. They still come back and sell those shoes at what? $120, $130, $200, right? Um, so... <clears throat> The goal of those who control, I'm going to end it right here, the goal of those who control the land, labor, capital, technology, and resources of this society and most of the world, the goal is to get us back to 1870. That is, the goal is to get us back to an impoverished population where the labor unions have been broken, where there's no minimum wage law, where there's no child labor laws, where people work harder and harder for less and less. The harder they can get you to work, the poorer they can make you, then the harder you will work for less and less. You might ask yourself, why is it Americans won't work for 18 cents an hour the way those Indonesians do? Is it because we're so, so much 
more self-respecting? Is that it? No American would take a job for 18 cents an hour. No, it's because we're no longer in 1870. We've had a century of democratic struggle of organizing in the workplace, of fighting for a better life, a better, a better, a better size of the pie. And the goal is always relentlessly by those who think the pie was given to them by God and they don't have to give anybody a crumb or a slice. The goal is to get us back to 1870. In other words, the United States was a third world country a hundred years before the term third world country was ever coined. In 1870, we had child labor, we had mass poverty, we had typhoid epidemics in Philadelphia and Baltimore, we had mass unemployment, we had people living in desperation, prostitution, beggary, I mean, big time. Um, we had a few people in obscene wealth, obscene riches, and the mass of the people struggling with a very small middle class just hanging on by its bleeding fingers. That is their goal, to get back to that, where they can write the tickets, where they are not bothered by people who who are trying to constantly better their lives at the expense of those who own it all. The thing about the, the difference between the struggle between the haves and the have-nots, the haves are really the have-it-alls. They want it all. They want to bring back 14-hour workdays. They want no social services. They say that. They want, they, with GATT and WTO and, uh, and, and NAFTA, and FTAA, which is now pending, the goal is to eliminate public services. To Any public service will be now be considered an infringement, an interference with the private market, a lost business opportunity, and the public, whatever it is, the municipality, the state government, or the federal government, would have to pay uh, some imaginary lost compensations to any corporation that's in that particular line of business. No social services, no social benefits. They say that. They don't want social security. They're nibbling at it. They can't come right out and say, let's get rid of the whole thing, which is what they want to do. It doesn't work. Instead, they tell us it doesn't work. It's going to go bankrupt. It's going to go so bankrupt that it's got an 80, 100, 200 billion dollar surplus and they're dipping into it. He's eager. Bush is eager to dip into that social security and spend it on more arms, more more guns, more satellites, more outer space uh, missiles, more aircraft carriers, all of which are going to stop a terrorist with a, little, um, with a little ceramic knife, aren't they? As they've done so brilliantly so far. <clears throat> so they are still fighting against the eight-hour day. They're still fighting against occupational safety. They call it bureaucratic intervention, interference. They're still fighting to destroy and roll back labor unions, and they're doing a very good job of that. Uh, you know, half a century ago, 35% um, of our workforce was unionized. Today, it's down to something like 13%. They're still fighting against public health programs, against public education, against disability insurance, and old-age pensions. <clears throat> so what we need then is a global anti-imperialist movement. There is a U.S. empire, um, and we have to oppose it. And we got to point out that the patriotic thing, the patriotic thing is to have a government, this is our flag too, the patriotic thing is to have a government that works for the interests of the people in column B and not for the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Mellons, the Huntington Hartfords, the Bill Gateses, and the others in column A. We not only need an anti-imperialist movement, we already have one. We saw it in Seattle against the WTO, in Washington, D.C. against the IMF and the World Bank, in Prague, in Quebec City, in Sydney, Australia, in Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Genoa. Um, they call us agitators, but I have another word for it. When people get out and they mobilize and they demand a change and they expose an issue and they confront that issue and they offer an alternative, they call us agitators. I have another word for it. I call that democracy. Democracy and democracy, and let's have more of it. Thank you.
guess. Yeah, I'll do some questions. Uh, there's a question I know someone's going to ask. What, what about the terrorists? What do we do about that? Is, does anybody want to ask that question? What? Can you go into details about um, U.S. involvement in Afghanistan? Union? Well, the first intervention in Afghanistan wasn't the Soviet Union. It was Pakistan and the U.S. They went in. There was a, a military officer's revolt against the right wing. The military officers were leftists. That means leftists or people who did things like wanting to educate children and women in Afghanistan, wanting land reform and such. The Mojahedin tribes did not like that idea. The big landowners didn't like that idea. The Pakistani military didn't like that idea. So there was this fight. The left military around Kabul and a few other places was heavily besieged. They repeatedly called for the Soviet Union to come in. The Soviets reluctantly, by the way, refused the first several overtures, did come in and got themselves involved in a proxy war against the U.S. and the CIA, lost it, went out. The country was taken over by a Mujahideen government. The um, <clears throat> opium, opium production went up tremendously. But that was another thing. With the, with the left officers and the Soviets as they interfered with a, a very profitable Soviet, uh, so, uh, with a very profitable uh, heroin trade coming out of Afghanistan. Uh, some of the, quote, best heroin in the world comes from that region. In fact, most of it comes from that region through Europe into the U.S., into Europe too, and other places. Uh, heroin production's up again, the Mojahedin are back in, um, and then suddenly, there emerges another group called the Taliban. Supposedly, they're college students. Yeah, right. They're college students who had a whole infrastructure, had the best arms there were, had communication, transportation, striking power, organization, and money. It turns out they were financed by the CIA. The most retrograde element has taken over in Afghanistan. And so you now have... Um, you now have a Frankenstein monster in a way, that is you have a creation of the West that now is n less than friendly. The Taliban actually is saying, well, we want to negotiate with you, you know, we're not, we're not going to invade your country or attack your country, don't, don't attack our country. Um, there is a way to stop terrorism. Um, bombing Afghanistan, a country which has been ravaged by war for the last 10 years, killing these people, these, these, these herdsmen, these tribesmen, you, you're not, you're not going to get, you know, they bombed, they, we've been, we, the U.S. has been bombing Iraq for now 11 years. They haven't scratched Saddam Hussein once. He hasn't missed a meal yet. He has slept in a warm, clean bed every night. You killed an awful lot of other beautiful people. I can tell, I can tell Mr. Bush that, and they're still doing it. Uh, so go bomb some hillsides in Afghanistan with the super missiles, kill bunches of people. You have to have hundreds of thousands of people fleeing in terror. There's terror at work already. And, and, the, and this is causing even greater starvation, greater dislocation, greater sickness, illnesses, when populations just start moving like that. Uh, there's no productivity going on. So it, it's got, it gotten terrible. If you want to stop, if you want to stop terrorism, then we should not or the U.S. leaders should not try to be owning and controlling the planet. That's why we're so hated. I mean, you could have a country that has a foreign policy that pushes for international agreements, for cooperation. Why don't we, why don't we respect the nuclear freeze? Why don't we sign on to the landmines bill to stop the landmining thing? Why don't we stop the race of, of armaments into outer space? These are some of the things you can do. Why don't we start respecting the economic development in other countries and the cultural, economic, social, cultural, religious development in other countries and, and, and pointedly say we extend the hand of friendship that your development and well-being and prosperity is not a threat to us. It's something that you have every right to. And if General Motors next year doesn't make five billion dollars in profits because now you, Yugoslavia, you, you've made your own car and you've cut into the profits when we're going to make, they're going to make only 4.9 billion in profits or even 4 billion or 3 billion. That's General Motors' problem. 
But as I say, the prosperity and development of other countries does not detract from our own prosperity. The poverty in other countries does not add to our prosperity, as I gave with the example of Nike, as I gave with the example of what happens to labor in El Salvador. But that would be the way to be a country in partnership rather than being a country that's the almighty one that says we can go in anywhere, we can tell any country what they should do and what they shouldn't do, and if they don't do it, we'll bomb the stuffing out of them. Who gives these leaders in Washington the right to do that and dictate? You see? And this is, this is it. The U.S. Congress in this, in this orgasm, this or, I'm sorry, this orgy of... This orgy, it's like an orgasm, everybody's screaming, of patriotism, orgy's, orgy's bad enough, um, orgy of patriotism turns around and votes 420 to 1, votes total power to President Bush. Says, we give you the power to pursue all out war against any nation any organization or movement or individual as you so choose. You know, he can get up and he can say, I have, I have special information, I can't reveal it, but uh, it's coming in Marseille, I'm going to bomb Marseille. He wouldn't do that because France would be, uh, all of Europe would be horrified and all that. But, that, but that's, what, that's what it comes down to. And of course there are, in fact, some of, uh, some of U.S. allies are saying, oh, wait a minute, who appointed him king of the world? Wait a minute, he has absolute total power now to go bomb and to see attack anywhere? You know, I mean, some of these European countries have investments in such in, in Middle East and Africa and all that, and they don't particularly want to see their pharmaceutical factories get bombed and their chemical plants and whatever else. Um, so uh, that's not the way to do it. You know, when, when, um, when Ronald Reagan sent those Marines into Lebanon and the French, there were three contingent went into Lebanon. U.S. Marines, French soldiers, and Italian soldiers. The Bersaglieri, elite unit, went in. Sometime later, five Marines were killed over a period of a week and a half from sniper shots. Then a suicide truck with explosives went right into the Marine compound and exploded and 183 Marines were killed. So altogether, that's 188 killed. Another suicide car that very same time went into the French compound and killed a large number of French soldiers too. The Italian compound wasn't touched. And I wondered about that, why that was so. And sometime later, I met a Lebanese friend who was very involved politically. I said, how is it you didn't hit the Italian compound? And you know, the president of Italy at that time was a guy named Pertini. He was a socialist. He had been a partisan fighter against the Nazis in World War II. And he was very popular. He was known as the people's president. He was very much liked. And he did a lot of good things. He sent those troops into Lebanon, but with a different mandate. He said, don't go in as conquerors. Go light and be, develop good relations with the people. The Italians... This Lebanese friend said to me, well, they were wonderful. This is not to say Italians are so wonderful compared to other ethnic groups. I'm not into that, even though I am Italian and have a lot of ethnic pride. This is a story I do like telling, though. Anyway, he said, he said they put up field hospitals, they put up clinics, they helped the people in Lebanon. People came in who hadn't seen a doctor in their lives, you know. They got all this kind of help, and they did all sorts of things like that, uh, assisting the population. So these mad, crazy, bestial, insane terrorists apparently can make discriminations, you see. You've got to ask yourself, why are they targeting the U.S.? Why don't they target Denmark? If they just want to be evil and kill people, why don't they target Denmark as a free society, democratic society, and it's wide open. Security measures in Denmark don't even compare it to the U.S. Why don't they target Sweden? I'll give you a soft target. Why don't they hit Luxembourg? I bet we could take out Luxembourg. Why don't they go in there and hit him? Why, why did they do that? Why didn't they hit that Italian military compound? But they did hit the French and American ones. If you act like a conqueror, you're going to be hated as a conqueror. If you act as a friend and partner, then there's room for cooperation and work and negotiation. But if you act as a friend and a 
and a, and a, and a partner, then you're not serving the Fortune 500 anymore. And that might be a problem. So it's time for us to really become politically aware of this fact. Do not, do not believe, do not believe anything they tell you. I mean, some of it may be true, but that's the problem. Always ask yourself, is this true? How true? What does he mean? What's the part of the story I'm not hearing? And look to alternative sources. It would be at this point that I might plug my books, but I, I won't do that. By the way, History as Mystery and To Kill a Nation are already published. They've been out for about a year and a half. Uh, any other question? I'm sorry, my answers tend to be very long. You know. Yes, miss. Yes. Yeah. Well, again, I do believe that the, uh, the Liberation Army that was come in, coming in was a Tutsi army, but it really made a point that we're not tribal. Any Hutu or Tutsi can be in this army, we want ethnic. It had all the aura of a Liberation Army. It had all the aura of a nationalist, self-determining army that was going to take its country and use its resources and its land for its own, uh, its own development. It had a lot of support among the Tutsi population, and so the Hutu were incited on the Tutsi. By the way, Hutu had some grievances, because the Tutsi, don't forget what happened in Burundi, where... Burundi? Is that... What? Burundi. Burundi. I pronounced it right. Burundi, where the Tutsi had slaughtered the Hutu, so you had the Hutu. And, and machetes were being brought in by the, by the load fills. Where did they come from? They came from someplace else than, than Rwanda. They came from the West. Bill Clinton explicitly prohibited the use of the word genocide in regard to Rwanda, even though it was a genocide. I mean, it was a systematic killing of all the Tutsi. And I think it was for the very reason I said. It was the same reason why the French, French military came into Rwanda and, and stopped that Tutsi army and stopped them from stopping the massacres that, were, that, was, that was going on and looked the other way when the massacres were going. They were complicit with it. It was a final solution against a troublesome population that was becoming political and politicized and critical of the West and wanting to claim its country for itself. That's not, I mean, there's a lot more about Rwanda that we would have to talk about, which I can't, um, uh, just one minute. Y yes. Um, since uh, democracy has the function of critical thought Um, I've written a book about it called Inventing Reality, which came out two years before Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent. Um, and it was, um, it, it shows, it shows, uh, I have case studies of it, it shows that uh, the news is pretty much a highly processed product and it's in accordance with those who own the organization. That the people who write or speak for the media know who they're working for. And, and, and these news media are all big, giant multinational corporations. Times, Warner, NBC, you know, they're all owned by big companies. Dis Disney, Westinghouse, uh, actually, the, actually the ownership keeps is changing and combining so, so quickly. There used to be, back Diggian points out, there used to be 24 major just 24 major news cartels around the world, and then it was down to 15, and now it's down to about seven, and it's going to be down to more like five pretty soon. Um, so the big corporations, and so, you know, you got to... I, I thought with this whole uh, world trade tragedy of last week, the news media was not just a lapdog, you know, the mouthpiece for power, they call it. Whatever the official them says, they send it out, and that's that. I thought they actually um, started clearing the way, which is what an ideological worker mm, is also supposed to do, I guess. Um, they were jumping in. They were saying things before 
the politicians ever dared to say. They're saying, this is war. You know who first said that? Tom Brokaw. He said it at about, at about a quarter to ten. I mean, the bomb, the two planes hit, the two planes hit, or maybe it was ten, ten thirty. I don't know, when, when, the, when the building came down. He was saying, this is war. This is war. War has started. This is a war that started. And so they were, they were getting that word out already, you know. Uh, this is evil. This is something that... Um, this has never happened. This is the worst atrocity in the history of humanity. Well, I don't know. I, I, I wish it was, but, but I think there are others that have been much, much worse. Worst act of terrorism. Certainly, this is the worst act of terrorism that we have ever uh, endured on U.S. soil. And that's gotten people all upset. Uh, yes, your hand was up next, sir. I'm not in this class. But I went to this school in 1942, and then in 43, 44, 45, I went off to protect freedom of speech, and I see that I won. Well, thank you. Now, was that a good war? Uh, World War II? Yeah, I think it was a good war to stop fascism and stop, stop Nazism. It, it took a bit of I doing. I the concentration camps, and I knew it was. Yeah, well, uh, that's what Eisenhower said to some of his troops. He says, now you know what you're fighting for. Look at these concentration camps. Um, yeah. Um, well, there's no such thing as a good war. Of course, you know, Benjamin Franklin said the only good war is the war that's prevented or never fought. And, and World War II could have been prevented if we had been firmer, if we had listened. There were very strong elements in Germany, in the German military. There were any number of attempts on Hitler's life, not just that that one time, and they had made overtures to the British intelligence service, we'll knock them out, we'll take them out, we'll even put in a conservative government. They knew who they were dealing with. We'll put in a conservative government, but we don't want this guy because this is going to mean another world war and it will mean the destruction of Germany. The German generals knew it and it was right. Of course, he, he got most of them and purged them and, and killed most of them. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, when it came, yeah, guys like you, we all owe you something. Um, freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, and I'm using it. That's right. I didn't want to go to waste. You, you, you put your blood, sweat, and tears into it. Uh, I think she, the lady next to you had her hand up first. Yeah. Uh, because some of us are out of the streets talking to people about the situation in Iraq and Palestine, and they're saying that the Americans are going to be the Well, I really, I really do think that most Americans do not know of the U.S. role in Indonesia in all these different countries that I talked about. I, I really don't think they, they have most of that information. Um, if, you have, if you have information indicating otherwise, that I would like to see it. I do know that despite the monopoly propaganda barrage that they're hit with, you do get some uh, very unusual statistics, like on Iraq, a, mo a few weeks before Bush went in on Iraq, the, the polls showed that Americans, by very large majorities, preferred a negotiated withdrawal to get Saddam Hussein to take his troops out of Kuwait, as opposed to sending U.S. forces to attack. Now, West Bush, Bush didn't want to hear that at all, and he was pipe pumping up every one reason after another. Every day they were coming up with another reason why they had to go in. Babies were being torn from incubators in Kuwait, the Iraqi soldiers. Remember, 500 babies torn from incubators and thrown on the floors of the Iraqis laughing. And, and then people suddenly said, uh, 500 premature babies in incubators? What is uh, All of Los Angeles County has only 45 incubators. What is it? What is it? Kuwait specialize in premature babies? Or what, what's going, what is this? No, but no, but, but these atrocity stories were up and all that sort of thing. And then once the, once the troops went in, then what happens is 
the other jingoism kicks in. It's uh, support our troops, uh, the flags get waved, and, and all that sort of thing. But remember, remember, you know, George I, when he was bombing Iraq and, and killing all those people, and Congress was calling him, passing resolutions, praising him for his unerring leadership, courage and fortitude and so forth, um, his approval rating was 93%. And within a year, he lost the election to a mediocre governor from Arkansas, you see. So it, it doesn't mean anything. George, George, George II, you know, his approval rating has gone from something like 32% up to, up to 80%, uh, the way he's handling this. Uh, it, but it's a craze. It's a, there's just so long you can keep hyping, uh, flag waving, and and beeping your horn, USA, USA, USA. After a while, you got to live, and living means facing certain realities. You know um, how things are really going. <clears throat> so I, I I am rather discouraged by the extent to which I, I've seen this again and again. How leaders can be easily demonized. I remember when Omar Gaddafi of Libya, this was years ago, was uh, Gaddafi, Gaddafi, there was this Gaddafi, the demon Gaddafi. And I'd go around and people were Gaddafi. I'd go lecturing around the country. People would, what about Gaddafi, Gaddafi? Gaddafi going to get your mama, Gaddafi, you know. And I'd say, Gaddafi, what is Gaddafi going to do? He's got a little ragtag, here's a nation of three million people and they're actually convinced they actually convinced people in our country that this guy was a mortal danger to the security and survival of the United States with an army of 50,000. What is he going to do with a ragtag army of 50,000? And, and, and he had manifested no interest in having hostile relations with the U.S. He repeatedly made overtures, I would like to negotiate a, a friendly friendly position with the U.S., and instead he was targeted and bombed, and his little, his little daughter was killed in a terrorist attack by U.S. planes. You see, when the U.S. planes come in with jets, that's called a raid. That's not called a terrorist attack. People down there see it as a terrorist attack. It's the same thing in Palestine. The Palestinians are terrorists because they use cars and machine guns or whatever else, and the Israelis are retaliating with jets and tanks, and that's, that's seen as retaliation that's not seen as a terror attack but it's 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 using terror too and then the same thing with noriega and then the same thing with saddam hussein who is it who is a slime ball uh but uh but for for the wrong reasons i think they were attacking him and, and killing his people and then we heard about milosevic and then and now we're hearing it about afghanistan uh, Osama bin Laden was again trained, equipped by the CIA. He and his cohorts were used in the CIA war in Afghanistan against the, uh, the Afghan revolutionary government. And now he's turned around and he's gone into business for himself. Let's have just one more question um, because I know you folks want to... Uh, uh, well, maybe we should make it two more questions. One here and one there, because I see you're jumping up. I, I, I know. Okay, yeah, go, ahead. Yes, go ahead. I'll try to give shorter answers. Well, that was a very good example of the media moving ahead, not being uh, the responsive lapdog to officialdom, but, but jumping and, and putting all these things out, out there and, and clearing the way so that, so that the politicians could feel snug and safe to say those things. Uh, the media was saying that. You heard people saying, well, you know, we have the, the luxury of democracy and maybe it's a luxury we can't afford as much as we have, or we've taken democracy for granted, but maybe we shouldn't take it for granted too much anymore because we're going to have to do with less of it, or our civil liberties. They're, they're saying those sort of things. Yeah, I think they will, tar if they target, if, if, if they can whip up enough hysteria, they will target... Um, political dissenting groups. One of the groups they're going to target are the anti-globalization activists and see them as terrorists and use the term against them as purveyors of violence and all that sort of thing. You know, these few, a few handful of these young people dressed in black 
smashing a window in a Starbucks or a Gap store is called terrorism and violence. It's really just a, system, a deliberate systematic destruction of corporate property as a form of political protest. No, nobody was getting hit or something. The police, meanwhile, coming in, in Genoa, you know, Berlusconi's Carbonieri, fascist little pigs were going in and bloodying people in their sleeping bags and, and beating the hell out of them in the middle of the night. Uh, that, that wasn't called violence. And killing one, one demonstrator, as you know. Um, this is why we have to um, stay alert uh, to this whole question about civil liberties. And, and the best way to protect your freedom is to exercise it vigorously. That's the best way. Uh, the, as, as with the physical body, so with the body politic. The way to keep your, keep your body politic, to keep your community, your democracy strong, and to get whatever little democracy we do have, uh, you know, voting for this one or that one, but it's to exercise dissent vigorously and fearlessly. To keep yourself quiet, to quiet down, because uh, this is, I don't want to talk now, um, is, to do, is to do the work of your enemies. The, you're silencing yourself before they even have to lift the finger to silence you. Uh, yeah. Um, it's not really a question, but I have this point of view. Um, first of all, when I think about the whole country is the economies like Microsoft and Internet Country and set up and then people are working there, we're actually living in a country of paper. People like it, they love it. Well, let me answer that before you go through your shopping list. Wait, before you go through your shopping list. Uh, that's not necessarily true, you know. Uh, people who work in these countries at subsistence wages, like the Maktelia daughters in uh, Mexico, are not all that particularly happy with the kinds of jobs and the conditions of the jobs. And the 17-year-old, 16-year-old girls who are working in the Nike uh, factories in Indonesia do not like and love us. They, they, uh, they, there isn't really any evidence of that. But, of course, if you compare that kind of miserable... 12-hour uh, uh, underpaid job uh, to nothing, then, then yeah, it's better. If, if you're going to give me the choice between nothing and immediate starvation or a job where I might be able to scratch through a little bit of something uh, for 12-hour for, uh, days, six, seven days a week, I might have to take that job. But I don't, I'm, I'm not really sure that this gives them a, a love for us. That's not my impression. gave a whole lecture to the contrary, and they are, uh, but you certainly are entitled to your opinion. I hope you might give it some critical examination. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention. Mm -hmm.